Welcome, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and call roll. Chair Filseth. Councilmember Fine. Here. Councilmember Holman. Councilmember Tanaka. Here. Three present. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the Tuesday, November 7th uh, Finance Committee meeting. Um, first item is uh, oral communications. If there are any members of the public who wish to speak to any item not on the agenda, uh, seeing none, uh, we'll move to the first action item, which is approval of Human Relations Commission recommendations for the second allocation of 2018-19 uh, 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 Human Service Resource Allocation Process funding in the amount of $311,118. And is there a staff presentation or anything like that? So, so I was going to say, why don't we do that and then ask members of the public to speak? Is, is that all right? Please proceed. That's Thank good. You. Thank you so much, Chair Phil Seth and committee members. My name is Minka Vanderswag. I'm the city's human services manager. And joining me at the table is Jill and Ann, a member of the Human Relations Commission, and um, uh, the chair of the Human Relations Commission, Valerie Stinger, and many of the other audience members are representatives from the agencies that have applied for his rep funding. So as you know, we are here tonight to bring you the HRC's funding recommendations for the second allocation of Human Services Resource Allocation Process, affectionately known as HISRAP. So HISRAP is a grant program open to organizations who deliver direct services to Palo Alto residents so they have a safety net of services that otherwise might not be available. And I just wanted to give a few words on why we're here today in November and when this usually happens back in May. So as you may recall, last spring when his rep was brought to the Finance Committee as part of um, CSD's uh, budget, um, one of the applicants, Adolescent Counseling Services, who had been the provider of on-campus counseling programs at all PAUSD secondary school campuses, withdrew their portion of their HISREP application to serve that, um, that area. And that left over $100,000 on the table in HISREP funding. And they'd also been a HISREP awardee for over 30 years, so the HRC felt pretty uncomfortable just saying, well, let's just reallocate the funds among the other HISREP grantees. The city has had a long time commitment to mental health services on the um, secondary school campuses and they also thought well let's also open it up for other grantees that might have asked for a modest amount of funding and now a greater amount of funding is more available and there might be agencies in the community who never apply for his rap because they have this feeling that it's a closed group because of the funding that's available and they never apply so the council concurred with that, and they also very generously, thank you, gave 44000 in extra HISREP funding. So we then um, distributed an RFP last August to over 35 agencies in the community, and we received eight applications. And the funding request that we got was exceeded the available funding by over $200,000. So we received applications from um, two agencies that had never received HISREP funding before, and the rest were from agencies that were already receiving HISREP funding um, curr um, currently. Although a couple of those agencies are, were pretty new to the, the HISREP family, as we call it. So then the next step in the process is that a subcommittee from the Human Relations Commission reviewed those applications and they brought their recommendations to the full Human Relations Commission for their review and deliberation. And I'd like to ask Commissioner Joe Lonan from the HRC to go over those deliberations um, with you right now. She was a member of that subcommittee. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mika. Thank you, Finance. Finance Committee members. I'm Jill O'Nan. I'm a member of the Human Relations Commission. I served on the Selection Committee for both the first round and the second round of his wrap allocation recommendations. Um, I thought I'd talk you through our process and then invite any questions that you might have. 
As Minka said, we had an unprecedented opportunity to do a second round of funding, which was awesome, which is a great responsibility to have. Um, and I'll start with some of the funding requests that were pretty um, straightforward and, and easier for us to handle. Um, as Minka mentioned, we did have some new agencies come to us. One was PARCA. Um, this is an agency that provides um, independent living for adults with disabilities and we have heard over the years from many many Palo Alto residents that they have adult children with special needs and they would like for them to be able to live independently and that it's very difficult in this environment with the housing situation uh, being so tight so Parker's work is directly on point with what we're hearing from the community and it was a relatively discreet request so we decided to go ahead and fund them um, not the full amount that they requested but uh, close to the full amount that they asked for to um, to serve the Page Mill Court residents. Um, as we said, I think that's an, an unmet need, and this was an opportunity to bring a new agency into the Hisrap family. We also had requests from some of the agencies that we've been working with to, in order to extend or expand the programs that they're working on. Another agency that's relatively new to HISRAP is Vista Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Again, we've heard many times from the community that there were long wait lists for people who have visual impairment to get this very specialized one-on-one -on -one training so that they can continue to stay in their homes and live independently. Um, we decided to up the amount that Vista got. They had gotten a, a grant in the first round. We gave them a grant in the second round. This will enable them to see several more um, Palo Alto residents and help them with this very intensive one-on-one -on -one training that I mentioned. Um, Momentum for Mental Health is another group that has been a longtime HISRAP recipient. They have basically one outreach worker who specifically deals with the homeless who have mental health problems. And by giving them an additional award, he'll be able to spend more hours in our community dealing with that population. Um, Kara is a new member to the HISRAP family that got a very modest grant in the first round. This was a first time grantee. We thought that by upping the amount in the second round they can do more meaningful work in the community. They have been collaborating with the school district around grief counseling and as you know with the suicide clusters and problems we've had that's been an urgent need for the school district and that was an, a way to um, help support that collaborative effort. Um, Dreamcatchers is a program that we've all been very supportive of. They joined HISRAP a few years ago. They asked for a very specific small grant to fund a new volunteer coordinator position that will enable them to expand their volunteer mission. They've been doing great work with the middle schoolers and helping um, underprivileged youth get caught up so that they can achieve in high school and go on to college. So again, we felt very supportive. Um, where things got a little bit more complicated were with the larger grant requests from three agencies. One was CASI, which is the replacement for our adolescent counseling services, the on-campus program. Uh, one was Community Working Group, which is sort of the oversight body for Life Moves, um, which was formerly Envision Shelter Network. And the other is Downtown Streets Team, which is a longtime HISRAP grantee, but had asked for funding for a different program, not the Downtown Streets Team program, but for the Food Closet program. So we had to wrestle a little bit, a little bit with these three. Ultimately, what we decided was all three were very crucial to the community. The on-campus counseling program is obviously mission critical, especially in light with a recent suicide that started at um, the beginning of the school year. Community working group is running day services um, through Life Moves and, and their other partners. That day services program serves underprivileged families and individuals, including children, who need that, that drop-in service. So we felt that was important to continue funding. Um, downtown Streets team is now running the food closet. Without some additional support from the city, there's a chance the food closet would not be able to open every day, which means people would be going hungry. So because all three needs were perceived as very critical, we came up with a funding allocation that was roughly equivalent. There was some disagreement about whether some agencies get a little more or a little less, but eventually we were able to compromise and, and come up with these funding recommendations. None of the agencies got everything that they wanted. Um, except maybe dream catchers, but um, good, good job, dream dream catchers. But um, since his rap funds never match the full need of the community, we felt this was an equitable distribution that taps into different needs, um, including seniors, homeless, youth, children, um, and so on. And so this is what we have brought to for you today, and be happy to answer any questions that you may have about our deliberations. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd really like to do is get to the public. So what I'm going to suggest is that we defer council questions and comments until after that, unless somebody's got like a really burning question they have to ask. Really quick. Okay, great. Super. Then uh, why don't we do that? And the first speaker uh, will be Jim Sarducci, and uh, you'll have three minutes. And if you could come to the podium. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. 
Yes, I'm uh, Jim Santucci from CARA, Executive Director with CARA. I just wanted to express my gratitude for the committee and um, the, the city for really supporting us. We've been around the area for 40 years. We've been embedded in the community, providing grief support services. It is a quiet type of work that we do, but more recently in the last few years, we've been really supporting the schools with the tragedies and the suicides that we haven't been experiencing together. So getting support from the city is really important for us because as a donation-based organization, we rely on donations from all those we served. And so being able to get a shot in the arm from the, the city in that way is really helpful, and it really helps us to do that work so that we can ensure that every Palo Alto resident that comes to us and the school students can get the service they, they really need, and whether it be in our group format, one-on-one -on -one format. I personally came to the agency as a client myself nine years ago, so I value the agencies more than I can, more than I can imagine, and that's why I serve as its director. So thank you so much for the opportunity to receive the funding and be part of the HisRap family, and I would hope that um, we would continue to be in years to come so they continue to do the good work that we are doing serving the, the residents. So thank you. Thank you very much. So the next speaker will be Sharon Hudson from Vista Center. I'm a little shorter. Hi, I'm Sharon Hudson, and I'm the Associate Director. I'm also one of the instructors uh, at our agency, and I <coughs> am grateful for this opportunity that y'all are uh, thinking about expanding some of the funding um, because that allows us to expand the services that we can provide to the people in Palo Alto. Originally, we were able to just do the core uh, living skills and orientation mobility. The expanded grant will allow us to do counseling and support groups as well as uh, assistive technology training, which makes a great difference to people whether they can actually do a lot of things on their own. Assistive technology is actually the booming thing for uh, that's really opened up the world for a lot of people who are blind and visually impaired. And so uh, having that opportunity to offer that service is um, a, a great boost to our clients. And uh, the counseling and all that goes with, it's really a grief counseling itself in when you lose something like your vision, uh, you do grieve it. And uh, it not only affects just the person, but it affects the family as well. So we appreciate your uh, taking this time to uh, hopefully support us a little more. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for doing what you do. Right. The next speaker will be Kyle Morgan from the Downtown Streets team. Uh, welcome. I'm a little taller. I'll put it back up here. <laughs> so good evening. It, thank you for. It, it moves up a little. Well, yeah, I don't know, maybe not, not quite this high. <laughs> um, good evening. Thank you for having us. I'm Kyle Morgan, the project manager of Downtown Streets team within Palo Alto. As most of you know, we were founded in 2005 in Palo Alto, and we're proud of our history here. And we're very thankful for the city having funded us for the past few years in our work experience program. Unfortunately, after having taken over the food pantry, uh, that city funding doesn't cover the food pantry operations. Uh, the food pantry it kind of offers a different service to some of the individuals and families in Palo Alto. Um, and it's unique in the fact that it's helping people um, just get by. Uh, compared to our work experience program where we're helping people go from point A to point B. Uh, the food pantry serves over 400 people a month and those are families and um, single individuals and without our food pantry services which are open five days a week um, some of those families would go without food. So I want to thank everyone here this evening for considering us for the extra funding and thank you for all of your um, past, present, and future support. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker will be Barbara Klausner. Hi Barbara. Down again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I just want to start by saying um, nobody's ever accused me of kind of, I was going to say being on the spectrum and not quite getting the social cues, but I have to say that I did submit the, the request for $10,000, not because we don't need more than $10,000, but because I was just sort of being very straightforward and realistic about what I thought were the priorities of the city, given the amount of money that was... Um, available, but we certainly could use more than $10,000, but I see all these other great organizations. Um, but this is a really exciting, uh, I was going to use like the Silicon Valley words like pivot, but it's not really a pivot. It's um, This is really the first time that I wrote a grant that was different from 
all the other grants that I've written in the last few years. Because the focus of Dreamcatcher, since it started by a Stanford undergrad in 2008, was about helping the low-income households that have middle school students in Palo Alto Unified. And they definitely need help. There's a huge opportunity gap in terms of the resources that are available for those families. It looks like they can go into a Palo Alto classroom, and why can't they just access everything that's there? We have great teachers. We have great you know, families. Um, but you know, you have to picture what it feels like. Um, I have all sorts of analogies that I, I've been thinking about. Um, and the latest one is really about, um, it's interesting, my, uh, actually talking about some of these other organizations, my parents were elderly and they passed away and, uh, recently. And during that time, I remember being in the hospital and knowing that they needed services and knowing they needed help. But, and I'm pretty smart, and my brother has a PhD in science. We couldn't quite figure out kind of how to access everything that the hospital had to offer. Um, and in some ways, that's kind of the way I think about the Dreamcatcher's families. Uh, it's all there for them here in Palo Alto, but they actually need some help figuring out how to access what's there. And that's actually what Dreamcatcher's tries to do. But let me stop there and say, the real change with this grant was focusing on the high school and college tutors. And it was only watching the growth of the program in the last few years that I realized that this actually is almost as value, if not as valuable an aspect of the program as the services that we're providing for the low-income middle school students. So we now have an equal number of anywhere between, depending on what time of year it is, 50 and 80 high school and college tutors who come in and they're developing these one-on-one -on -one relationships. I just came from a YCS event you know, the connections and the relationships. Um, and we've gotten feedback and comments from the high school students. We have a whole bunch of students from Pally and Gunn um, and how much it means to them. It, it makes them feel like they're, they're giving back to something. There's some meaning in what they're doing. Um, and so with this extra $10,000, we were able to hire someone who's specifically a tutor coordinator and she happens to have a master's in social work to really focus on what can we do to support our volunteer tutors so that they have a really valuable experience um, and it's another way to support Palo Alto youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll return to the committee uh, for questions and comments. Councilmember Holman. So this is um, both one of my favorite and least favorite things to do. <laughs> uh, favorite because we get to you know, distribute money to or allocate money to organizations that are more than worthy and uh, least favorite because there's never enough money. So, um, so it covers, covers that gamut. Um, if we were going to give it by um, best names, I'd say Dreamcatchers has the best name and Cassie has the best acronym. So <laughs> <laughs> just put that out there for whatever it's worth. So um, I just want to make sure that um, the grid that we have on packet page eight, just want to make absolutely certain that it's clear. So the, the right-hand column is what's already been approved this year by the full council. And what is in the first column, though, is what they requested this round. That is correct. This round. OK. All right, good. And then when I looked at the, uh, the minutes for the uh, HRC, it didn't seem like there was much difference. And all we have is the motion here. So it was kind of like, what was? Um, either one of you, maybe maybe Joel. So the the dollars are not very different. So what no, what were the holdups yes. on being able to get consensus? The the amounts reflected, unfortunately, were was a slight error. Um, um, no, the, actually, she means um, the different motions. Oh, the different yeah, in the in the really motions, it was like the dollars four to five thousand dollars. Right, they got a no or a yes. Yeah, okay, that passed. Yeah, that six hundred one is. Yeah, that was an error. That, that seems like yeah. it must be an error. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think what it came down to were there was um, a group of commissioners who wanted to fund Cassie at a higher level, more, I think it was forty thousand dollars, and then reduce community working group down to twenty-five thousand dollars. And then there were other commissioners, of which I was the second group, which wanted a more equitable distribution. Part of the thinking was uh, on the one side was that Cassie was doing work that and the schools um, and had been overwhelmed with requests because of the suicide and we wanted mm -hmm. to make sure we were giving them adequate support. On the other hand, um, community working group may have an opportunity to get money from the county, but the county would like to see Palo Alto make a significant contribution from the city, although there was no hard number attached. Uh, we were also concerned that youth is also served by community working group through their day services program. So we're trying to serve youth but in different ways. So, and it was a little bit of a philosophical difference, I think, um, 
and, and it really came down to a few thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. a compromise was reached that we came up with this distribution where uh, Cassie didn't get quite as much as the one group wanted, but not as little as another group wanted, and the three agencies ended up being pretty much within a few thousand dollars of each other, so that all three critical needs could be addressed in a meaningful way, or what we hope will be a meaningful way. Okay. And then uh, one other question is, I mean, you, you sort of touched on this with community working group and uh, youth, but Cassie is pretty much taking the place of, um, of uh, ACS. Yeah. Uh, yes, correct. Yeah. So was there conversation, I mean, you, you sort of suggested that some wanted to give the full 50 to that. So what was the... I think it was 40, actually. 40? Yeah. Okay, they asked for 50, but you, you talked about 40. So what was the... Was the ultimate deciding point just that oh, this is a more um, evenly distributed among those three that got the higher allocations? Is that just a more uh, even allocation, or how did the group, the both your uh, subcommittee and then the whole board talk committee, talk about um, you know the replacement for ACS and the actual absolute uh, critical service that that provides, not funding at a higher level? So right, it, well, it's that balance. Like, how do you not fund? Cassie when it's replacing ACS but well still. agreed um, and in, there was some some of it had to do also with the the availability of other resources for the agencies and some of the history that we had with funding the on-campus program so in the past the city had actually been funding it at a, I think even a higher level than the school district now the school district is spending significantly more on the on-campus program and came to us with a much lower funding request. So it appeared that the school district does have some resources and we weren't sure how much they really needed from the city, but we certainly wanted to make a meaningful show of, of support. Community Working Group and the Downtown Streets Team Food Pantry are really in pretty desperate mm. need at the moment. I don't know that those agencies have an abundance of resources to pull from. If the city doesn't give them some seed money to start their fundraising effort, I think there's a real danger that the food pantry would either close or have to dra drastically reduce its hours, and community working group might have to suspend its day, day program altogether. So there was sort of some push and pull. You know, right. of course we support Cassie and the counseling, but if people are hungry and, you know, not being housed, those are also on the most basic priority of needs, sure. too. And so it, it was an effort to try to, to touch on all of the needs and respond to them, but we couldn't you know, give all the, you know, cast, I mean, Community Working Group actually had asked for a very large grant, which if we had done that, that would have been to the exclusion of the other agencies. And mm -hmm. so these are hard choices, and there may they not are. be a, a perfect choice, but this is what we as a group felt would enable each agency to carry out, out its mission and make the lives of Palo Alto residents better. And that is, you know, the least favorite part of this. So, um, yeah, if um, I think it precedes by a little bit the time of uh, council members um, Tanaka and Fine being on the council, but the food closet was close to closing uh, a couple of years ago. And um, I think we used uh, part of our $50,000 uh, emergency uh, funding, didn't we? Um, we didn't. There was a point where the management of the food closet, when it was in... Um, Pretty hard state. Um, downtown streets team approached Life Moves, which was operating it, and in a decision, the program transferred from the one agency to the other agency. So that's it, how it was. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have any other um, questions or comments, other than you know wishing it was a lot more money. But thank you for your work. I mean, I, you know I'm just a great fan of the Human Relations Commission, and thank you do tremendous work, and, and all the nonprofits that are here, too, and represented, and those that aren't here, too. Just thank you so much for your work. Councilmember Fine. Thank you. Um, so I also do want to thank all of these great organizations. I mean, these are really serving kind of the underserved, sometimes invisible people in our community, and I think it's pretty amazing what all of you do with in the scale of a city budget, so little money, actually. So I do want to echo what Councilmember Holman says. Um, I did have a few questions also about why there were those motions moving around. Um, I would just put to my colleagues, I would tend to agree that it's probably better to distribute a bit more equally, especially when some of these service providers are serving the same groups. Um, we want to kind of spread our bets there. Just one question. Am, am I mistaken in that Project Sentinel used to be under this? Project Sentinel was in the HISRAP program till about 2008. Okay. And then it just it asked to be out of the, the HISREP process, and now it's just a direct um, contract 
with the city. So it's their um, contract is within human services, but it's general fund money, just a straight contract and not within his rep okay. anymore. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and the only other question, you said you put this out the RFP to about 35 organizations and got 10 or so applicants? Eight applicants, Eight from, applicants yes. From about 35? Yes. What, where's that list of 35? Like where, where do we get that and, and how do we make it? How do I make that? I look at other, um, I look at the priority of needs that mm -hmm. is established and then I go through the agencies that I know that address those needs um, in Palo Alto or for Palo Alto residents. So Human Services also oversees an um, information and referral database called Family Services, Family, um, family Resources. and most of those agencies are listed on that database. Okay. So again, I very methodically go through the priority of needs to be able to reach out to agencies that address these needs. That's how Parker got on the, the list. They, I know that they've been in Palo Alto for years running the Page Mill Court. I run a program for developmentally disabled adults. Some mm -hmm. of our participants live at that facility. So it's it's that's really how the, the list is managed Excellent. and added to. I guess I'm just asking because it would be, you know, as long as we can keep that fresh and up-to-date and expansive and bring in new folks when possible. I look at it yeah, every great. time we go out for his rep, I update that list. Cool. Thank you. That's all. Um, I'd be happy to support all of this as is. Greg? Yeah, so thank you guys for your work on this. I really appreciate it. I know it's not easy, uh, mainly for what my fellow council members said, which is there's a lot of great organizations out there and not much money, so it's always very difficult. Um, so I'm a little bit new to to uh, reviewing some of this, so I just wanted to just get some background on it. So these, some of these questions may seem extremely basic, but um, I guess what is the criteria for the organizations that are considered? Like how do we, like what what are the parameters that we use? Well, we have, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so in the RFP, um, we list, we have review criteria that we go in evaluation criteria, but as far as an, uh, um, the actual agency, they have to be serving Palo Alto residents. They have to um, meet one of the priority of needs. Um, they do not need to be a nonprofit, but um, but till this day, most all the agencies that have applied for his rep are a nonprofit. But we primarily look primarily look at that they are meeting the needs of Palo Altans in the priority of needs that has been established by the Human Relations Commission after doing a series of needs assessments. Does that answer your question? Fully? It does. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, um, so that's that's good, right? So we're using taxpayer dollars, residents' dollars, to serve Palo Alto residents. I that's, think that's correct. That's that makes that makes total sense to me. Um, okay. Great. Um, and um, and so. Uh, for all of these programs that are listed here, are all of them going to help just Palo Alto residents, or are they helping people who uh, may not be residents of Palo Alto? Some of these agencies help people that are not Palo Alto residents, but our his rep money only goes to Palo Alto residents that are their clients. So only Palo Alto residents. Okay. So and so there's a stipulation that they cannot use the money for any non Palo Alto residents. That is correct. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. And, um, okay, and then um, my other question is effectiveness. So one, th one thing I was very inspired by is um, the Gates Foundation. I'm not sure if you guys follow kind of the work that they do, but, um, you know, I, I think I was, I was listening to a podcast about Bill Gates and Melinda and how they're trying to do giving. And as it turns out, giving away a lot of money is actually hard, and, and being mm -hmm. effective about it is ex extremely hard. And one of the things that they did, and maybe, you know, we're not at the level of the, you know, Gates Foundation, right? But um, one of the things they did was they, they try to measure the effect, effectiveness to, see, to kind of maximize the good mm -hmm. that's being done with the dollars. So kind of like return on investment. So what do we do in that regard? How do we know that, that you know, for the, you know, amount of scarce dollars that we have, we're maximizing the return for the city, for the city residents, right? How do, we, how do we know, like, how do we measure that? How do we even, is there any quantifiable way that we can see if this is, like, 
you know, we're, we're making the right investments? Right. Well, I'll answer that as, as best I can, and if um, Commissioner Onan wants to go in. So each of the grantees is part of the work that they are proposing are required to come up with a scope of services that has clear and measurable outcomes. Mm -hmm. And on a semi-annual basis, they are required to report back to the city their performance measures in each of the areas of the scope that they are, um, that the city is funding. So staff um, looks at that. They look at their contract measures, their actuals. They have them, we have them indicate any unmet um, performance standards and an explanation why those aren't being met, any unmet client needs, um, their financials. Mm -hmm. The HRC goes out and does a visit. We go out and do a, a, a visit as well. We get their audited financials. So we try to really look at the fact that they are doing what they say they're going to do. They are directly meeting the, the needs of the clients they say they're going to meet. They are, they are meeting very clear, measurable outcomes. And um, that's, that's, that's what we, we try to do in monitoring these contracts and, and trying to... Is, know, is there some sort of like, like the dollars that we spend are pretty you know, clear return, I mean, it's pretty clear investment, but do we, do we have some sort of measure of uh, quantifiable goodness that the organization brings, so to speak, like just trying to, just, just to, because, you know, the problem is, I mean, and I, I say this with seriousness, because mm -hmm. there's 35 organizations that applied, right? We, we can only right. give money to eight, and even then, we couldn't give money to all, all that we, we wanted to, right? Right. And so, um, it, unless unless you kind of break it down to some numbers, some, some sort of numeric numbers, you could kind of see, well, this one seems to have a higher return investment than this other one. It's hard to know, are we, you know, there could be that maybe some organizations are just much more effective in terms of bang for buck than others, right? Right. And so we would want to, so to me it's not so much spending the money to everyone because I think there's some organizations that are just higher performing than others. Of course. And the ones that are higher performing, you want to give them more, right? And the ones that are less performing, you want to give them less. So right. that's why I, I, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't see any sort of return investment or ranking or anything like that. So it's hard to judge. That's why I'm asking like, well, the metrics that you guys well, are using. Well, if I could jump in, um, Council Member Tanaka. Um, in this type of scenario, it's really deceptive to try to rank things as if all the agencies are on an equal playing field. Certain types of services are extremely resource intensive. So for example, with Vista, if I'm working one-on-one -on -one with someone who's lost their sight and I have to train them how to use public transportation, get around their home, use their stove, mm -hmm. use an assistive technology on their smartphone, mm -hmm. it may take hours of one-on-one -on -one intensive training. Now another organization may be able to use a group format to help many more people, sure. but we have, but then we would be saying to blind and visually impaired people, well, you're just not a good return on investment. It takes too much time and, and effort to train you. I don't know. So, I mean, so we wouldn't do that. So that's why it's difficult to rank the agency well, I mean, vis so vis I, each other. I yeah. encourage the, um, your team to look at, like, like I think Bill Melinda Gates, I think they've done a pretty good job in terms of trying to, because they, they, they do try to quantify it, because it, the very things that you're talking about is what they're, they're trying to do, right? Because, right. Um, because even though they have billions of dollars, they also want to make sure that they're maximizing the good in the world. And mm -hmm. so, and I, I know, I realize that a lot of this stuff is really soft, touchy and feely, and it's kind of hard to quantify, but if you, unless you do that, it's hard to know, like, are we maximizing, you know, the dollars of, of the city? And so, and, it's, and if you keep it kind of fluffy, then it's, it's all kind of gut feel, like it's my opinion against your opinion versus some sort of... Well, ours is, it's, I mean, it is, but there is some you know, opinion that comes into play with the HRC, but we talk frequently with people in the community and with the agencies who serve mm -hmm. people in the community. We have a large and growing senior population, for example, that is losing vision. And, I mean, people are liberal, living longer, and one of the bad things about living longer is that you lose certain capabilities, and sight's one of the first things that can go. We also have a large population of people with diabetes who are subject to retinopathies and other problems with their vision. There is a strong, growing demand for visual-type sure. services. So being in touch with what the community needs is part of what informs the HRC. So it's not all 
we just like this agency or we don't care as much about this agency, is that people come to us and say, mm -hmm. my son or daughter has autism and needs to live independently and there's, there's nobody here in Palo Alto to help us do that. Or my child needs services at the schools, you know, he or she's depressed and we need to have counseling. We hear this from the community and so we're trying to be responsive in that sense. And I think all of these agencies meet demand and in fact there's usually a long waiting list of people waiting oh, to, I have to get no in question for even that, more services. I have no question that there's a lot of demand for all these services, but all mm -hmm. of them seem extremely worthy. My, my only point is that, is that um, you know, just like companies, just like anything, there's usually a spread of performance, right? There's usually some that are just really high performing and give them just a little bit of money and they do amazing things, and others which, for whatever reasons, maybe, you know, what, for whatever reason, they're not just as effective, right? You give them some amount of money, they don't perform as, 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 uh, as, well, as, they, as well as maybe some other ones. And so, um, and, and that's why I'm just, I, it's, it may be beyond the abilities or scope or um, to, to do it right now, but that's something I just want to encourage, be, just because I think otherwise these kind of calls are very, extremely subjective. Um, um, well, I, I do take your point. I think another thing to bear in mind, though, is that not all problems are immediately solvable. So, for example, people who are homeless often have a myriad of problems, addiction, mental illness, uh, income problems, criminal justice problems. So that population tends to be chronic. So you could say, oh, we're spending a lot of money, we're not getting return on investment, and yet we are because we're keeping people out of trouble, we're keeping the streets cleaner, we're giving them some opportunities to improve. We may never solve the problem of homelessness. It's an extremely difficult, complex problem to solve, but we're managing it and we're making you know, people on the margins safer, better and keeping the community safer and better by investing in at least managing the problem even if we can't cure it. Other things, I mean, we can really address and, and take someone from point A to point B and transform their whole life. And that may look like a better investment, but if we don't manage some of these chronic things, mental illness doesn't go away, homelessness doesn't go away. Those are things that you just have to, to deal with in the community. So th there's, as I said, it's not really apples to apples always in terms of how the agencies perform. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I, I mean, you, you bring up another good topic, which is that, um, is that, uh, you know, a lot of times there's like a certain amount of capital or money you need to get something happening. And if you don't get, like, I'm not sure if you've ever seen the, kick, the, the website Kickstarter, mm -hmm. where, like, unless you get a certain amount of money for, the, for your goal, you just don't get funded, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you could get one dollar, but that one dollar is not going to help you build, you know, a spaceship. It's just not mm -hmm. going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. You need a certain amount of money in order to do that. And um, so I, I also wonder about that too as well, right? I mean, some of these organizations wanted a lot more than we could give them to, right? And so I do wonder, like, um, you know, there's the whole idea of your, your and I, I kind of know the feeling, we're trying to be fair, we're trying to spread our bets and stuff like that, but sometimes maybe, maybe unless we fully fund it, it's not, it's like, um, um, I'm not sure if you guys have ever read the book, uh, Will Be Gone? Mm -hmm. uh, look, like, there's like in, in this fictional town, like the average, like Lake Wobegon, Lake Wobegon, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's okay. this story about the average family, and there's like two and a half kids, right, or something like that. Like and they, they met the family of two and a half kids, and there's two kids, and there's a half, right? Like, a, so, like, <laughs> so I'm saying, so like sometimes when you, when you don't give enough of the budget, right, that's mm -hmm. that's needed, you have this Lake Wobegon issue, right, where mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. a half a kid, right, and I mean half a kid work, works in Lake Wobegon, but not in Palo Alto. So mm -hmm. that's what right. I wonder, right, is that if we if we um, if we do, I mean, in some ways, if it, it, giving them the full funding is, is like forcing us to prioritize, making sure that, that, that people can truly execute. Because if you don't give enough sometimes, you get to the two and a half kid with like Bobby gone problem. So that's the other thing that I've been thinking about is in terms of how the money was mm -hmm. split. Yeah. Like, are we giving enough capital to the organization that really asked for it to fully execute and, and do a, a sufficient job that can execute on the mission that we want them to execute on? Versus mm -hmm. like, if you just give it a little bit and Mm -hmm. then they have to go scramble for something else, right? That could also make it difficult. So I, I just wonder if that's, that was under consideration well, as well. Well, there's kind of like three aspects to that. So one is that a HISRAP requirement generally is that the agency cannot be overly dependent on the city. The city can be one source of funding, but the majority of their funding mm -hmm. really should come from other sources. So they know, they know that going into but, the So it's like a Kickstarter process. where unless they get enough, we don't give that money? Is that the way it works? 
Um, well, we look at di the diversity of their funding right. resources and do they have um, some kind of model that will allow them to sustain because we can't have agencies come to us for their full operating okay. budget. No, I, I get that. I think so that, that's part of the HISREP deal. But what agencies do is they come to the city, they get a grant of some amount, and that is sort of like the seal of approval for them. Mm -hmm. They can then go and much more successfully fundraise out to other areas, including the county, by saying, hey, the city of Palo Alto gave me this grant. It may be a modest amount of money, but that money means that they were vetted and approved here, which really aids in their fundraising efforts. And we are thanked many, many times by the agencies, even for small amounts of money, because it serves like a seed capital for them to go out and fundraise. But it shouldn't be more like the Kickstarter model, where unless you get, you know, we could give, you know, Paul took a chip in a bit of money, but unless they raise the full amount, they need to really run a program. You know, like well, I, think, well, I, think, I, think, I think what she's described is a very, very coarse way, okay, of approximating what you said. I mean, it's very, very coarse, okay. But the question that you're asking, and it's a legitimate one, is, geez, if somebody really needs two hundred thousand dollars and we give them twenty, and we wasted the twenty, yeah. And I think that's sort of what you're asking. Yeah. And I think what you've said is, well, you know, we only look for people where the majority of our funding comes from someplace else, okay. And so that doesn't guarantee that that's not going to happen, but it makes it less likely if we're sort of, you know, not Correct. sort of. So why don't we make contingent based on raising all the money? Well, so that they can, they can make sure the programs are fully funded. Right. But, this, but the, programs are often, sort of your the programs are sort of aspirational in some sense and often very scalable. Um, oftentimes it comes down to if they had the full amount, they could fund a staff position all year at full time. With a partial amount, they can at least give us a social worker. 10 hours a week to, to work in the community. So the, we do get the services, it's just that we'll maybe see fewer clients and we'll have fewer hours. That doesn't mean we don't get it at all, we just get a portion of it. And again, we know that going into it as well. So it's it's a, a bit of a, a push and pull with, with the agencies and, and they know that we're doing the, our best to try to get them some funding to help them with their fundraising efforts, but they also know they're going to have to supplement from other sources that they won't be able to rely fully on the city. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, my two cents. I, I just, I think the Kickstarter model is not a bad model to follow because they make sure that, uh, you know, because if, if they don't really need all the money, then they shouldn't ask for all the money. They should ask for what they need. But if they need a certain amount, we should actually try to hit it. Otherwise, my concern is what what Chair Phillips just said, which is maybe the money gets wasted. and We should have put that money to another organization that could have used it and ran an effective program. So. Anyways, so that's my mm -hmm. comments. Thank you for that. Thank you. So I add on everything. Thank you for Kathy guys for doing what you do, and, and mm -hmm. it's I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that it's not an exact science. So mm -hmm. it takes people. Right? I just had one question. I think you may have answered it with uh, uh, with Karen, but uh, the the four two split um, uh, on the motion that was did, did I hear you folks say that was primarily about sort of the the, the split between uh, uh, Cassie and the community working group is that? I think and, yes. and that downtown it? streets team. And the downtown the top team. three. The yes. Top three. Okay. And but that was. So what was what was the, what was the minority what was the minority uh, minority opinion? I think the minority opinion was that they wanted Cassie to get I think it was forty thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. And they wanted community working group to get more like twenty five. Ah. Okay. And, and then, then the rest of us wanted a more equitable split, and we wanted to help community working group position itself to get the additional county funding. Got it. And we felt that Cassie had some additional resources at the school district and didn't need the money as urgently. Okay. All right. That that was good. Thanks. <laughs> so motions, Karen, you want to take want to do the honor here? Um, before I make a motion, though, I uh, thank the HRC and. And uh, y'all can never leave. <laughs> but uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't also uh, recognize Minka because Minka has mm -hmm. been doing due diligence on this for how many years now? Oh, six or seven. Yeah, and always. I mean, you can tell the commitment by uh, the investment of information and time and knowledge that you have in this too. So I want to thank you as well, please, very much. Um, so uh, with that. Um, I will uh, move the uh, staff recommendation, which is to approve the uh, HISRAP agency funding allocations as recommended by the HRC and authorize the city manager or his designee to execute uh, one-year contracts with the organizations recommended by the HRC for not to exceed amounts recommended by the HRC for fiscal year 2018 with an option to renew for one additional year, that being fiscal year 2019, 
The total amount of these contracts should now exceed $155,559 per fiscal year. Um, just uh, speak a little bit to um, comments that um, and questions that Councilmember Tanaka was asking. I think they're I think they're diligent comments and questions. Um, it is um, not exactly as uh, as the response you're getting. It's not exactly a science. It's one of uh, responsibility and research and diligence, uh, as much as it is you know being able to measure things because things aren't things. Life isn't exactly measurable. Um, accomplishments aren't exactly measurable. Failures aren't exactly measurable. It's the progress that's made uh, in the course of uh, helping other human beings uh, and life conditions. So I think your questions are very good ones. Um, I think they're just very, very difficult questions to answer uh, in the ways that might be more satisfactory uh, to, um, you know, different minds work in different ways, and, and that's why we're all here, and that's why we have a nine-member council, because we think in different ways. So I very much appreciate the questions, and I hope the answers and responses were, were satisfactory. So um, the organizations listed here and many, many others that don't even apply because it takes time to uh, make application and there's limited funding. So some organizations that serve our community and serve it very, very well don't apply uh, because of the likelihood of success and the likelihood, especially for the return on investment, uh, because the time it takes to, to make an application and go through the process and stuff isn't worth even the nonprofit's time to get limited amounts of money. So um, I thank the organizations that have applied. I uh, thank you for the work that you do, the service that you provide to our community and community members, and uh, also thank the HRC and Minka uh, very much for your service. What Karen said. <laughs> yes. So I, I was, I'll be supporting this as well. I mean, I don't mean to give you guys a hard time, but I, you know, I, I, you know, before I listened to this Bill Gates, Melinda Gates thing, right? I also thought, you know, this is kind of touchy feely. You can't measure human life and human suffering and all that kind of stuff, right? It's just, but um, you know, I guess what I was really impressed on is how they did turn it into a science, right? They really did quantify things. They really. I mean, you would think that with so much money, you would just kind of spread it around and, and call it a day. But no, they really think about it. I mean, they really try to get some smart people thinking really hard about how to like maximize the good in the world. And so, um, I realized, you know, we're not the size of that organization. You know, this is not even a fraction of a percent, right? From so, of course, we probably can't go to that level. But you know, I I, I think for anyone that's thinking about giving, right? Or you know, it's it's. Um, not a bad idea because, um, you know, th there's just, I mean, just like with everything, there's such a spread in performance difference, right? Some people do, perf some organizations provide so much more than others. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to, tr you know, and I realize you guys are all volunteers, but, um, but I, I think it's, you know, to, it's our, it's our responsibility to do diligence to try to make sure that uh, we, you know, we, select high-performing organizations. But, you know, I can't do it here. So I have to rely on your opinion and judgment. Right. And I appreciate that feedback. And I don't want to, you know, have the impression given that there isn't due diligence in review and analysis of these organizations. And we continue um, during the entire tenure of the grant. But I didn't mean it like that. I meant more not – I'm sure you guys do diligence. I'm talking about, like, um, the quantification, right? And, and I know it's like right. it's very heartless to, to, to turn things into numbers, right? But but when you have limited resources and you're trying to do some planning, right? You're trying to select which what are the priorities. You know, sometimes a failure to choose. Sometimes sometimes just spreading the peanut butter thin, you know, rather than putting on the things that really matter, isn't the most effective answer. Because I, I think I think um, choosing is actually also important. Right, and 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 that means there's going to be people that you're going to select, and some people you're not going to select. That's that's and and very so true. versus trying to spread the money across all these organizations, and maybe making a few extremely successful that really have a big impact on Palo Alto, would be the better decision versus, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, right. you know. I appreciate that. I, I you know, I, I'm sure that Commissioner Onan and um, Chair Stinger will bring that feedback back to the HRC. You know, it has been hard. They have a pretty broad. Um, priority of needs that they set. Some communities just set those as two things. They say, we're going to just 
serve, do homelessness and senior services. And the HRC has historically wanted to, to have his rep funding go to a pretty broad category. So I, I know that they'll, next time his rep comes up, that, that'll be a, a definite conversation that we have. We also try to work with our grantees throughout the, the tenure of their grant on improving the way that they work internally. We have technical assistance programs for our grantees looking at um, better ways in which they could build the capacity within their organizations, better ways in which they can track and measure the impact of the work that they, they do as, as well. So I wanted to let you know that. Yep. So just one other thing it, it occurs to me that maybe would be uh, uh, appropriate or, and pertinent to make is that if we're going to leverage our dollars, if the city is going to leverage its dollars, so much better to give finite amounts of money to the nonprofits rather than the city trying to make these lives better and make Palo Alto a better community by trying to, you know, source it all in-house. So it's another way of thinking about leveraging our dollars and making better use of our uh, limited funds. Right. And uh, in the very beginning of HISRAP, a, a lot of the programs that were funded were kind of offshoots of um, services that the city was providing in-house. ACS, if you look at um, um, Avenidas, mm -hmm. you know, Senior Coordinating Council um, previously. So that was at the core of the beginning of his rep, of leveraging those dollars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us tonight, and, and, uh, and, and good luck and Godspeed with it. That's not on the flyer because there's a, an internal audience of the, of the Wednesday night meal program. So it really isn't looking for people from the outside to come to the Wednesday okay. meal program. It's looking for the um, input of those people who are already there. Okay. Yes. Very good. So uh, oh. next on the agenda, future meetings and agendas. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have a proposed change to future meetings. Um, we, uh, staff has determined that um, the items that were scheduled for the November 28th meeting, uh -huh. which was an extra meeting that had been scheduled in, yep. um, would be better served by bringing them to you later. Um, so we would propose canceling that meeting and just moving forward with the December 5th meeting where we do the annual financials. So then the transportation impact fees in the uh, parking management study would go out into potentially January, is that what you're saying? That's talking? correct. They'd be in the new year. Okay. Um, so, uh, is it because the information it won't be available or compiled by then, or what's the rationale? Yeah, yes, staff are still working on the information. So you got two For pretty... For both of those things? For both one and two? You got you, two pretty different things there. I, I think staff are working on an overarching uh, set of issues related to parking and transportation and how all of those things fit together yeah, well, and I, want I, to bring them forward in a more strategic fashion than we'd be prepared to do right now. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're answering. Maybe you answered this already. But I know, that, I know that staff, after the Planning and Transportation Commission meeting, sort of went back and was going to do sort of a little more thinking on the parking and the, uh, the parking management and finance study. Is the, but the transportation impact fees I w would have thought was different, but you're saying actually they're closer related than you might guess? I think we'll know that better when we bring them to you. I think we want to be thoughtful and strategic about 
bringing them in a framework rather than piecemeal. Okay. So I think item number Sorry, item number one, the transportation impact fees, is also somewhat contingent on our discussion next week on the comp plan. Uh, right, because it's one of the mitigations that we may be considering. Yes. Transportation impact, yeah. Uh, transportation impact fees. So when when the council raised the raised the part the uh, parking permit fees. Does that count as part of the transportation impact fees? And is that sort of the same umbrella? When you say count, I'm not sure I know what you mean. <clears throat> so the uh, council <clears throat> um, a month ago raised, uh, raised the proposed or uh, increased the staff's uh, increased, moved, <laughs> moved to increase the cost of parking permits downtown by an amount uh, adequate to cover the gap in funding for the TMA this year that was requested, right? And specifically for that reason, which then got allocated. So is that what we mean by a transportation impact fee? No. Is that is, is no. this how to fund the TMA? Is no. that? Ah, okay. I think this is seen as one of like the mitigation for some of the jobs numbers and stuff we're looking at, right? Okay. You look like you're about to, you want to well, say. I was going to say, I can, it, depending on how far you guys want to go down this, um, but you're right, the transportation impact fees are separate. They're associated with um, additional congestion, additional development, and whatnot, and the fees associated with mitigating those impacts, whereas the parking fees are um, fees and charges. They're part of our municipal um, fee schedule, and you're right, they did go into effect, and those funds were allocated to the TMA. Um, in terms of the downtown parking management financial plan, or well, financial study and plan, after PTC, staff went back and regrouped um, and ultimately have put in kind of a different but more slowly phased plan. Okay. Um, however, what it does mean is potentially we're going to have to upfront provide some funding. And so rather than coming to you guys with just information, we want time to think through what does that mean, what's the right strategy, what are some options, so that you guys aren't kind of floating around in the dark with, here's all these things, but we don't know how we're going to do it. Okay. Um, and so we want some more time to flush through that, given all of the funding priorities that this organization has. Okay, okay so if we did that, then... Okay, so then the November 28th meeting would be canceled and the, Correct. Next one, the next one would be December 5th. Correct. That's going to be a big meeting. Well, it was going to be a big meeting anyway, yeah, so we're so not adding anything to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, so for the December 5th meeting, since um, we have item 5, which is the long-range financial forecast, and I think we're supposed to also address some of the pension issues, right? Um, so what I was going to suggest is that we invite, um, formally invite, uh, Professor Bulow and uh, donation to the meeting. Which I, I believe you already did that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think the mayor said we should talk about it because uh, otherwise the league will flip out, right? So, um, so that's what I'm doing. And yeah, so uh, uh, the uh, uh, committee has reached out to the two Stanford professors and see if they're interested in joining the, joining the meeting on the 5th. And if they reply in the affirmative, then we'll 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 ask we'll bring this back to you and have a discussion on it. Okay, great. And I think legal had um, raised the issue the last time about how we manage public comment at the committee meetings. Yep. So we have to notice it properly and so forth. Great. Yep. Thank you. And there was also the question about Stanford and our negotiations with Stanford too, and that relationship too so you'll inform us of that prior to the next meeting we'll have legal take are, are you directing us to have legal take a look at your invitation not yet okay I'd, I'd rather wait and see if they're interested your microphone i'd rather wait and see if they're interested first okay it was the the data sharing because that's what they were mostly interested in, and I thought why they came last time was they're trying to um, get access to that data sharing. And I saw staff members over here uh, expressing some concern and raising some concern about that. So, sure, and, the and that's a legal is, issue. Sure, and in your guys's prior motion, um, you guys asked us to explore that. Um, we have reached out to the donation, frankly, at Stanford, um, and so. We will report back to you guys as part of long range. 
um, kind of. Is there an that update? It's is, in progress. Is there any update on that discussion, by the way? On long range. On on the uh, the, sh the data sharing with uh, with uh, donations project. Um, we shouldn't get too far into it. Yeah. It's not agendized, it's not so agendized. I don't I don't want to. Yep. <laughs> speaking of legal, since Terrence isn't here to keep me in okay. line. Um, the one thing I do want to tell you guys is, as we're pulling together this long range, given how large of a report it's going to need to be, it may come to you in chunks. So please bear with me. Um, by that I mean uh, John Bartell and his staff are extraordinarily busy. Um, so some of the information I will probably not receive until after the Thanksgiving holiday. So. It's going to be a really tight turnaround, um, so please excuse any brevity in the report, but also please do realize what we, I think we're going to do is bifurcate it and try and get you what we can in the normal packet process and then do a second at places with supplemental information. Okay. So, I see. So what you mean by chunks is that we'll probably see part of it in 11 days in advance mm -hmm. and the part of it we might not see until a little closer to me. Correct. Correct. Needs to be really good. <laughs> <laughs> noted. Understood. <laughs> noted. Understood. <laughs> Duly noted. Especially good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, do you need a motion from us to, to cancel the meeting? Or? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Then with nothing else, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Happy holidays, or happy Thanksgiving. And, uh, yes. <laughs>